Joellen Gibson asks that in the garden be included in our songs. This song, which is over a hundred years old, has very special words. The part that says, and he walks with me and talks with me and tells me I am his own, that explains that God considers that all who walk with Christ are special and unique, and God loves us as individual personalities. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses And He walks with me and He talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing i'd stay in the garden with him though the night around me be falling but he bids me go through the voice of woe his voice to me is calling and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever Well, here we are, week four of the virus shutdown, and it's Easter weekend. And here we are with not quite an empty sanctuary. It's been being just me and Doug Watson. He's been doing the recording, and we have a guest with us today. His name is Buddy Blue. So uh, it's good to have Buddy Blue with us today, too. But uh, we hope that if you're watching this or listening to this, that uh, we can reach out to you with the gospel message and remind you that um, Easter happens no matter what. You know, Satan tried to prevent it from happening the first time and failed. And actually every week when we get together to worship, it's a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've learned more ways through this to communicate the gospel message and actually... In a way, we're reaching more people than we were before because there are more people watching this and attend our services. But we still look forward to meeting back here and seeing our church family again. And we invite you, if you live in the area and you don't have a church home and you've seen this, we invite you to come and worship with us when we start worshiping back at the church building again. We will probably continue to do some recording even after we start meeting. Uh, this has worked out well and we will probably continue it to some degree. What are some of the events that have happened in your life to you or your family that you still remember and your family still talks about that are special to you? I want to mention three uh, that's kind of happened to us, and this includes some of you who will be watching this as well. Even though I was born 
in Missouri and have lived most of my life in Missouri, with the exception of five years that I lived in Oklahoma. And my wife has also been in Missouri all of her life, and so have our two daughters and their families. Um, at the same time, we are big followers of the Tennessee Lady Balls College Basketball Program. And our introduction to them came back in uh, 1996. We watched them on television win the national championship and became intrigued by their coach, Pat Summit, began to watch every game that we could that was televised. And then uh, later, our oldest daughter, Michelle, when she turned 17, we asked her what she wanted for her birthday and she mentioned that she would like to go attend a home game for the Tennessee Lady Balls. So we decided to make that happen. We went to Knoxville, Tennessee, and they treated us like royalty. We called ahead of time, got our tickets, told them what we were doing. They told us if we'd come to a Sunday afternoon game that they would uh, let us come in on Saturday and meet the players and, and take pictures if we wanted to and get autographs. They took us to the locker room and, and we got to meet a lot of people and just had a really good weekend. And the Tennessee Lady Balls went undefeated 39-0 that year and won the national championship again. And our family still talks about that. If you live in Missouri, you're familiar with both the Cardinals and the Royals. They both won World Series championships for uh, my wife and I, it's been the Royals. We, uh, we worked at a factory right after we got married and they played the Royals games when they were on the radio. They played the Royals games at work on the radio and we got to listen to them while we worked. And so when they won the World Series in 1985, it was a big deal. And then to see them win the World Series again in 2015, it was a big deal. And what can you say about the Chiefs? That's the most recent you know, they've won two Super Bowls, and the last one, of course, was this year. Uh, very exciting playoff games. And the, the thing I want to point out about all of these things is that they're temporary. I think the Tennessee Lady Balls have won eight, a total of eight championships. There's other teams out there that have won more. And next year, they have high expectations, and if you don't meet those expectations, there are people who complain. They look for a new coach. You know how that works. Um, the Chiefs won the Super Bowl this year, but guess what? People are gonna be expecting them to win again next year, and they're gonna be really disappointed if they don't, because no matter how good you do, it never satisfies people. It's only a temporary thing. But what we're gonna talk about today is not Temporary. What we're going to talk about today is truly uh, an eternal victory that affects families, communities, countries, individuals. Uh, and, and we're going to look at a victory that never fades away. When Jesus was uh, born of the Virgin Mary into this world, things began to change. But from day one, there were those behind the scenes who worked against him. You may remember in the early part, the king had all the baby boys about the age of what he thought Jesus to be killed, hoping to get the right one. The Pharisees began to develop plots again against him. As soon as he began his ministry, they began to try to trap him and and the thing we have to remember is all of these people who were working behind the scenes to try to discredit Jesus or do away with him, their backing came from Satan. Satan was at work behind the scenes and has been from day one uh, in the, when it, you talk about the ministry of Jesus. And so we're going to bring that up to the time of Jesus' arrest, which we call Holy Week, but I don't want to spend too much time with that other than to remind us today that Jesus was arrested even though he had done nothing wrong. The accusation was blasphemy. Uh, let me tell you something, folks. If blasphemy was a crime that was punishable by execution, there'd be a lot of executions in our country today because there's a lot of people who blaspheme today. Uh, this was just an excuse. 
to try to do away with Jesus. So they arrested him. They had a, a trial, which by the way was a mockery. He was turned over to the crowd. The crowd's uh, wishes, uh, it really wasn't a crowd, it was a mob, and their wishes were to crucify him because they'd been stirred up by other individuals. So they led Jesus away to be crucified. He was crucified. He died on the cross. He was placed in a borrowed tomb. And you would think at that point, all was lost. That's how the followers of Jesus saw it from their perspective. And you can read scripture and you can discover that the followers of Jesus were very disheartened and very, they felt disillusioned and uh, they were very discouraged. And uh, most of them went into hiding at that time. And the enemies of Jesus undoubtedly were uh, filled with joy. Uh, they thought they'd won the victory. I, I wonder, you know, if you if you think about the plan that Satan uh, put into motion, uh, Satan undoubtedly thought that he'd won the victory as well. But having said that, what happens? Well, we know the story. Matthew chapter 28, I want to begin with verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guard shook for fear of him, and he became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. That has to be one of the greatest statements in all of the history of humanity. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. How that changed everything. And folks, this wasn't entertainment like I was talking about a while ago. This wasn't a sporting event. This wasn't a, a battle to see who the best team in the state was or the best team in the country was. This was a battle for the souls of humanity. And guess what? Jesus won. It's the biblical account of the most important event in human history. From the day Jesus came to earth, he never ever did anything but good for the human race. While on the other hand, Satan in his struggle for power and fame did everything he could to stop Jesus. Does that even make sense? Here we have someone who's done nothing but good. They've gone around counseling people. He's gone around healing people. He's gone around making people's lives better in every possible way. And they hate him for it. He was taking away their base of power and authority and they didn't understand it. And guess what? It's human nature. We have a tendency to fear what we don't understand. And when we fear, we take action against it, even though we don't realize that it's good. If we don't understand it, we don't want it. But that one event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, changed everything from that point forward. And yet at the same time, there's some things about that that we still need to understand. We can't give up and quit and say, well, Jesus won the victory on the cross when he rose from the dead. He won the victory, so we have nothing to fear. Everything's going to be okay, so it's life as usual. Well, no, not really. There are some things we need to understand about that. First of all, Battles are still being fought every day, spiritual battles. And the problem is, not only do we not understand our foe, but we can't see him, literally. Scripture tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that we're battling against powers of darkness. And I want to read that passage from Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 10 and reading through verse 13. 
It says, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness for this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. The battle is real. The foe is invisible. And yet at the same time, we can see him in so many events in history and in our lives today. Uh, we can see him in the patterns of our thoughts and our actions when we do things that we know are wrong, when we do things that we know are ungodly, when we get caught up in things that we know we shouldn't be caught up in. We see Satan at work even in the lives of his followers. We struggle to keep our lives on track. It's not an easy battle, but it's a real battle. It's a difficult battle. And the battle requires that we continue to do our part every day. And the only way that's going to happen is if we pay attention to what God's Word says about the battle. The second thing that we need to understand is, is that even though the battle is still being fought every day, the final victory, the end result, the final victory has already been secured. I like that. That means that even though I'm imperfect, and even though I still fail, even though I still sin, that because I have a relationship with me, he's forgiven me, and my final victory has been secured. It, because it doesn't have anything to do with me. It's everything about him. It's what Christ has done for me through his death, burial, and resurrection. Have you experienced that final victory? The third thing that we really need to understand is that salvation requires action on our part. Jesus went to the cross and died there. He was placed in a borrowed tomb. He rose from the grave. He provided forgiveness for us. He provided salvation for us. But folks, it does not happen automatically. It requires a conscious decision on our part. I've known people throughout the years of my ministry that just continue to try to rely on their family name or their family history or some good deed that they've done to get them to heaven, and it won't happen. I remember a long time ago in a church that I, old country church that I pastored, a man and his wife who attended church every Sunday morning. They never missed a service. But when I tried to talk to him about the Lord, he always put me off. And finally, we went to their house one day and sat down and tried to visit with them. And, and the thing he kept repeating over and over again was, my grandmother helped start that church. That was his claim to salvation. It had nothing to do with a personal relationship in his own life. His grandmother helped start that church. And every time I tried to ask him about his relationship with the Lord, he would say, but my grandmother helped start that church. Folks, his grandmother starting that church was a good thing, but it had nothing to do with his salvation. And I never could get him past that point. So I ask you directly today, what, what is it with you? Do you know Jesus Christ? Scripture says that we have to believe in him, we have to trust him, we have to repent of our sin, we have to call upon him as our savior, and we can do that. We have that privilege because he went to the cross because the grave couldn't hold him. We've been given the right resources to live our lives the way God wants us to. We have no excuse. He gives us the power we need through a relationship with him. He gives us the instructions we need by reading his word. He gives us an opportunity to grow in our faith by doing things like listening to this, by attending church, by opening our Bible, by coming to him in prayer, and by understanding that we're here by the grace of God. You've been given the resources. This passage that I read from Ephesians about putting on the whole armor of God, did you catch some of the things it talked about? Truth. Righteousness, peace, 
faith, salvation, the sword of the spirit. And there are a lot of other things that we could call out about this passage if we wanted to. The, the fact is we have the resources we need. Every day, the life of Jesus presented new challenges. Can't you identify with that? Every day that we live our lives, we face new challenges just like Jesus did. Every day, Satan attacked Jesus in new and unique ways. Sometimes it was his own followers that caused the problems in his life that he had to deal with. Some of his own followers did not understand what he was doing. They did not understand what God was doing through him. And some of them acted on greed and selfishness and their own desire for power. And Jesus called them out and, and uh, was never bashful about telling them when they failed. And yet at the same time, he always loved them and tried to bring them back into a right relationship with him. He was never on the defensive. He always had a good answer. And one of the things that has always interested me, earlier in the book of Matthew, when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, do you remember what it was that Jesus used every time Satan tempted him? He quoted scripture from the Old Testament. You see, that's why it's so important to know God's word. Because if it's embedded in our hearts, in our minds, when the right time comes, God will give us the resources we need and the right thing to say at the right time through the presence of his spirit in our heart. Jesus was mistreated. He was ridiculed. He was mocked. He was talked about behind his back. He was plotted against. These are all things that we can identify with that Jesus overcame. But then he went a little farther than we have. He was arrested for what he believed. That's never happened to me. I've never been arrested for what I believe. As a matter of fact, I've felt confident when I come into this building and step into this pulpit that everything will be okay. I feel confident that there's not going to be an official walk in the front door with an arrest warrant in their hand simply because I'm preaching the gospel, preaching the truth. I've never had that experience and hope I never do, but Jesus did. And after they arrested him, they broke their own laws to bring him to trial. And then they pronounced the sentence of death. The mob did that. And they executed him. But as I said earlier, it wasn't the end of the story. Really, in a way, it was just kind of the beginning. Because if you look at what God has done since then, it's amazing. It's amazing when you look at even recent history and the lives that God has changed through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Could that be you? If you're watching this or listening to this and you're an unbeliever, may I remind you, he did this for you. May I remind you that he's never finished with you. But the question remains, how will you respond to what he has done for you? Will you accept it? Will you trust him? Or will you ignore it and rebel against him? Or maybe you're watching this or listening to this and you're a believer and you know it, there's no doubt in your heart. Never give up. God's not finished with you yet. If he was, you wouldn't be here. He'd already called you home, but he's not finished with you. So as we come to this weekend and celebrate his death, burial, and resurrection, I always do this with mixed emotions. It breaks my heart that God felt it was necessary for Jesus to die on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. Mine. Not just yours. Mine. It breaks my heart that he went through what he did because he loves me that much and he loves you that much. But what do we do about it? Do we live for him? Do we remember that the grave couldn't hold him? Do we come to him in confession and repentance? 
and that we show how much we love him by how we live our lives in honor of what he's done for us. If you've never trusted Jesus, won't you do so right now, today? Father in heaven, we just thank you so much that your love for us was so great that you were willing to go to the cross of Calvary, that the grave could not hold you and did not hold you, and that the victory you won is not a temporary thing, that the victory you won is an eternal thing for all time, for all people those who would believe. Lord, I pray if there's one here that's watching this that has never trusted you, that they'd be willing to do so. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.